Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Cinefix Top 100, the podcast that jumped from the top of a building saying, so far, so good, as we fall past 100 of the greatest movies ever made. I'm Clint Gage, and joining me as always, Alex Stedman and Michael Calibro. Cal, Alex, how are you guys doing? Good, man. How are you doing? Bonjour. I, listen, I'll be honest. I, mm-hmm. I wrote this intro like right as the credits started rolling on my rewatch of the film that we're talking about today. And I just didn't feel like making jokes about your job titles. I was going to say your intro was killing it. And then you kind of just, you know, Peter, but that's fine. You know, fair warning. This might be a little bit of a dry episode. (laughs) (laughs) Really selling it. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, absolutely. As our community season rolls on here, we are talking about uh, a film from your favorite flavor of foreign film, Calibro, from France, La N. Guys, when was the when was the first and or last time you watched this movie? Uh, last night. Yeah, this is also a first time viewing for me. Oh my god! You now you're on. Oh, two you of guys those. never yeah. seen it. No. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm fascinated to find out where it ends up on the top 100. <laughs> it's actually my number 12. It's your number 12. Yeah. It was just you just assumed that. Yeah, you would I was like, like you know it, what, so this one sounds right. Yeah. It sounds like an Alex movie. <laughs> it kind of does. So, La Haine, it, it's 1995. It's it's a French film from uh, Matthew Kasovitz, which is and it's just kind of a day in the life of three friends from the projects outside of Paris uh, after a, another friend of theirs has been beaten by cops and hospitalized, which incites riots. Uh, and the movie picks up from there. So by the time it was over, no, I didn't feel like making funny little quips about your fake job titles that are... Because I, I did legitimately think about, like, what's a funny job title that's this movie related that I could give to each of you, and none of them, none of them. No, they're right. all so t- I just like, it. <laughs> yeah, just got like a guy who just takes his shit in a bathroom and ha- then talks to everybody for like five minutes. Or the guy, no, his his friend out who died after pooping outside of the train. I think. I just want to corner somebody in the office now with that. I just want to just like sit in the stall. Yeah, just gonna sit in the stall, wait for someone to go in there, and then. <laughs> Just talk about how I, I know a guy that embarrassingly died during the war. That scene in this movie is honestly one of my favorite. Uh, oh, yeah. Agreed. And I did flag it to talk about in the brilliant moment section. So <laughs> yeah. we'll probably talk more about that guy taking a shit. But, you know, I mean, this it's listen, it's a tough movie, but it's 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 not without its charm. One of the things that I really, you know, liked about the movie on, on I because I've seen it to answer my own question. I saw it once or maybe twice. But I did really respond this time to the guys like bouncing back and forth between dealing with all the heavy things that this this movie deals with, you know, all the systemic problems that they're that the movie is talking about. And then in the next scene, they're just they're just kids hanging out together. Guys being dudes. They bounce back and forth. Yeah, they bounce back and forth between those two energies, I think, really skillfully and in a really, really compelling way which i think is is part of the part of the charm in this movie i'd be curious to watch it again so uh, you said you did you like it better on your rewatch because i feel like this is a movie that i would appreciate more on a rewatch yeah i mean i i it's it it was still the movie i remembered yeah i guess we'll put it that way is uh, how much of a cop-out answer is that no it's not valid you know what i think it is too it's just like it's like a It's a very French movie, but told through the lens of American pop culture. Like what I kind of find fascinating about this movie is like, I feel like I've seen it all before and it's because I have, but at the same time, it feels like wholly unique and of the time of the place it comes from, you know? Feels very 90s to me. I think largely because the soundtrack because the rap. You know, it's 1995 and there's a handful of movies that immediately popped into my head. You know, movies like Train Spotting, and um, you know, movies like I, I think we before we started rolling, we mentioned Boogie Nights, and and those are the kinds of movies that I was like, oh, this reminds me of that. But then I looked it up, and this movie came out prior to both of those movies, so it's another situation of of like Chicken or the Egg. How how influential was this movie? And then you realize that because it feels familiar now, watching it, you realize it was actually actually it was on the cutting edge of all of those things that feel so familiar now. So. Yeah, I think this is in like the early times of like what I like to call like these 90s VHS kids that were making movies, Mm -hmm. you know, which is just like if like New Hollywood and Scorsese and them, right, were they were the first ones who studied films in college. But, you know, they had to like go to a movie, see it once and then just kind of remember it because they're not going to see it again. They might not see it again for a while or they just go see it like three times in a week you know, and then it's just kind of etched in your memory. But like these people that are coming up in the nineties and stuff like that, like 
VHS tapes hit in the late seventies, early eighties. And then you got like 10 years of like movies just coming out on VHS. So like, these are the kids that are like, who became filmmakers that are kind of like us that grew up, you know, watching a tape and you can just all the concept of watching a movie on demand is probably like, this is like the first iteration that it happens as opposed to like now where we can literally watch anything at any time. But like you could theoretically go to a video store at this time and just watch rent a movie every single weekend and watch it and just like totally digest it and consume it. And, and pause and rewind yeah, and study. And, rewind. And, and you could just see that and just the way that it exudes like homages and references. And that's a big part of what nineties movies are all about. And that aesthetic of it is just like the filmmakers that came up in the nineties were the kind of people that are like, I watched this movie 40 times on VHS tape. So I understand in intricate detail why this thing works and how I'm going to adapt it to my story. And yeah. I think that that is like, this is like the first time in like filmmaking history or just like in the annals of it, that that kind of replayability has worked its way into uh, the next generation of artists output. Hmm. Because yep. in, new, in new Hollywood, you don't see stuff that's just like, this is exactly like the killers or anything like that. Cause they just can't read like, like you just can't see it. That I mean, you do a little bit, right? I mean, like Scorsese, you look at Scorsese and, and mean streets and there's a scene that he lifted straight from breathless i think that that is in mean street so it's always happened to an extent I think. yeah but i mean in, in terms of like the new hollywood generation being a generate the first generation of people that like set out to be film directors like yeah you know because otherwise it would be a different art form and then they fell into filmmaking yeah is, is kind of like back in the 40s and 50s and things like that it was playwrights and all of that that were sort of finding their way to, to film as an art form but then by the time you get to the 70s and the 80s, like those people wanted to be filmmakers. And then by the time you get to the 90s, then, yeah, the technology being what it is, they're able to to study film in a way that previous generations weren't able to. Exactly. I just don't uh, think that's that... where the the hardcore homaging and, and some of the things that we see in this movie, too, I think are, are um, you know, when they're I say it's trying real homages. hard to be cool. Yeah, yeah it's tr it's just this movie feels like a grab bag of. Stylistically speaking, this movie feels like a grab bag of everything that was cool in the 90s. Like, I guess, like, what I'm trying to say is, like, I don't imagine that any 70s movie has, like, as direct of an homage to a movie from a late or an earlier period, like uh, Vincent Casal doing the, like, Are You Talking to Me from Taxi Driver. Yeah, well, and, and not like that's a character based thing, right? Like that's so like do it. Yeah, that that would that's the difference between Mean Streets and Breathless and then this movie and, and, and Lion and Taxi Driver is like he's it's such a it's a specific pop like, oh, this guy's into that movie is what it says about that character. It's not like it's not the director just being like, I like Taxi Driver. It's a reflection of the character being like, I like Taxi right. Driver. It's it's pop culture yeah. living in pop culture i have a lot of theories about how 90s was pop monoculture like we don't have much of a monoculture anymore and before then we didn't really like 90s and 2000s is when we were all kind of watching the same stuff and talking about the same stuff so i feel like that's maybe why homaging got really popular in the 90s and why it's so visible here hmm. that's my theory yeah well I mean, let's let's get into the before we get to we can start talking about uh, some specifics in the movie to all of these lovely, intelligent sounding generalities that were thrown out here. Um, <laughs> big words. But, I said monoculture. <laughs> no, I loved it. It was great. The pedigree of the film. So the, the movie came out. It was it was a hit. You know, Matthew uh, Kasovitz, the director, who I know him best as the love interest from Amelie. That's also um, how I, I, I love, which blew my mind that he I directed love, this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, love me some Nino from from Amelie. He's the guy who scoots a, scooters away at the end. Yeah, exactly. So the the film won, um, you know, it it won a handful of one and or nominated for a handful of important awards. Uh, you know, it, he uh, Kasovitz won Best Director at Cannes uh, that year, nominated for the Caesar Award, which was French Oscars and a handful of other things. Also, he edited the film 
uh, along with another, it's him and, and a guy named Scott Stevenson that have the editing credit, which uh, I think is honestly, the editing is one of the true, I think, bright spots of the movie to me. I think it's, mm-hmm. a, it's, it's feels like a movie that kind of found itself in the edit, you know, but then his, his follow up to Lion Assassins got a similar amount of acclaim kind of right when it came out, but it doesn't seem like it, it's had quite staying power that Lion has had. Otherwise, like he did some, some other films in America, Gothica, Babylon AD, which was a, a weird Vin Diesel post-apocalypse kind of sci-fi thing uh but nothing seems to have gotten close to the sort of lightning in a bottle of lion i mean i guess not terribly unusual that somebody comes out with their like their first big hit their big break and then never quite lives up to it like that probably is more more usual than unusual right like it does feel very specific like if that makes sense it feels like not a kind of style that you would replicate after that despite there being so many yeah well it's a lot of it works you know it's it's one of those the 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 style and the substance are sort of pulling in the same direction right like it was the right the right person with the right idea at the right time and they did it right and so it all adds up to like this is a great movie that 30 years from now we're still going to be talking about yeah, and you could just kind of like see its influences everywhere too, right? Like even the camera work. When I kept like when they kept on like talking in like the public spaces, all I could think about was the wire and how like mm-hmm. David mm-hmm. Simon and them use those like wide establishing shots to show that like no one's around and like using using the architecture and like the like the urban urban design as a character in the film as well to like establish the setting. It just looks so good and it's just that's what I mean when I say like I think this movie is very, very good. It's just that I feel like I've seen everything about it before. And yeah. that's both its blessing and its curse. Yeah, in terms of how a movie holds up, like yeah. if it's so influential that all of its, you know, it, it's sort of shaped all these other movies that you like, you give those movies more credit than you give to the one that you're not as familiar with. But Well, and that's why um, I feel like I'm not being 100% fair to it in my own thoughts about it, because the only thing I kept thinking of when I was watching it was train spotting. And I really like train spotting. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. And I just feel train spotting was a little more lighthearted. I, I mean, there was like dead babies crawling on the ceiling. But <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel like I, I could have made jokes about your job titles if we were talking about train spotting. The, de- the dead baby <laughs> crawling on the ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> But no, I feel like that's why maybe I'm, I am not being 100% fair to it. And I probably like it more than I'm giving it credit for is I've, I feel like I've seen it. Like, I feel it's one of those movies that maybe was so influential that it influenced a lot of movies that I've seen. I mean, ultimately, look, the, the, this movie lives and dies on the three, the three leads, right? Mm-hmm. There's Saeed Tamawi, there's Vincent Cassell, uh, Hubert Koundé. Um, these guys, you know, Saeed and, and Vincent Cassell, like they've, they're everywhere. Like oh, they've yeah. worked nonstop ever since this movie. Like the fact that Vincent Cassell has not been a Bond villain is weird to me. You know, yeah, like, there's still uh, there's still time. He's got there's that still space. time. No, no, he's he's gonna get there. Um, but uh, him and Black Swan. Oh so yeah. yeah, and Saeed and Wonder Woman. Also, else great. Big he yep. was in, um, Saeed. Oh, he's been in Chapter lots of three. He's been he's in, in John every, Wick. He's that's in, what I was thinking of. John he's Wick, in John, John Wick. Yeah. He was in. You're thinking of GI Joe, probably. Uh, <laughs> it was definitely he's, he's been Joe. in everything. All of the all of David O. Russell's movies since Three Kings, I think. Have you ever seen uh, uh, Vincent Cassel's Mezzarine movies? No. Those are also really good crime dramas. No. <laughs> that's that's Ocean's where I was like twelve. That's, that's where another really good crime those. drama with. What What's crazy to me is though my fate. I, I the one who really stuck out for me was Hubert. And Hubert, he's, yeah. yeah, he's like, I think the only one who really isn't everywhere. I mean, yeah, he's, he's also had he's the best art. He's worked a ton. He's what? He had the best. Yeah. Arc. Yeah. Yeah. He did. He's, he's worked a ton. I mean, it's, it's all, it seems to be all French film and TV. That's probably um, what it is. Yeah. He was in our, our, our friend, uh, Fernando Morales, uh, from city of God, uh, his English language film, the constant gardener, Hubert was in that, um, but that's about the biggest thing internationally that it seems like he's done. But the cool thing about these three guys, they were all nominated for most promising actor of the year at the at the Caesar Awards that year, which is cool because they were I mean, I think Saeed Tamawi was 21 or something when they were shooting this movie. Like they were they were all young. They got they ended up losing losing to Gerard Depardieu's kid, which part of me wanted to roll my eyes, but then I I read that that Guillaume Depardieu died in his 30s and that that I didn't want to be snarky about that either. This is Again, just bringing everything down with this episode. 
<laughs> uh, dry episode of Top 100, completely unintentionally. Well, like I, I, like, I don't mean for it to be dry, but it is such a hopeless movie. Like, it's so bleak, and there's not, yeah. that's not, like, there's nothing wrong with that, but man, I was just so sad <laughs> the time it was mm-hmm. over. I was like, the vibes suck. I'm like, I'm yeah. upset. <laughs> it's a tough, it's a tough movie, you know, and there's a, like I said, I mean, there's those bright spots, you know, throughout the movie of, of when they're, when they're just, when uh, Vince is cutting um, Saeed's hair, like, yeah, that's fun. That's, or when that's, they're like, uh, carjacking. You know, he's like, hey, can you yeah. give me, yeah. And the drunk guy is tapping <laughs> oh, on the window. Oh, we'll talk about that's dances. one of my favorites. <laughs> all of all of this stuff. So, like, as as much as uh, the movie deals with you know systemic violence and police brutality and and all of these frankly very familiar issues, you know, it does take it does go out of its way to make sure we remember that these are just kids. These mm-hmm. are just you know just buddies from the same neighborhood. Um, to the point where like them just goofing around is uh, like there's some of my most there's some of my favorite scenes in the whole movie oh yeah and it feels very like brotherly like it, they, the way yeah. they they separate and come back together it feels like oh you're stuck with me until the end well until one of them dies at the end they're so mad at each other almost constantly but that's also what I'm saying. it's brotherly not. like yeah like it, it, you you fight and that's what friends are for but yeah, I do think the exactly. three leads are perfect. Like, yeah, no, they're excellent. They're great. Yeah, like, and it, it is yeah. because I think they are so young and they truly, truly seem like stupid teenagers, but who also love each other. I think it. I, I like. I, I don't know if it would work with uh, with different actors, honestly. We'll say this though, you know, hanging out on a roof, grilling hot dogs, does actually look kind of like a good time. Well, there are times no, where it's like, well, even at the end when they're like sitting on the roof smoking and yelling at skinheads, like that also looks like a nice time. Honestly, just sitting on any kind of roof doing anything is always Sitting fun. on doing anything yeah, on yeah. a roof. It's, roofs yeah. roofs just, I don't know. They make everything seem Would you better. describe to it whatever it is that you're doing on the roof? Would you describe it as heightened? Yes. I, uh, would. <laughs> I, I don't get the joke though. Please explain. <laughs> I'm really, really sorry about that. This is a dry episode, so there is no humor. So you're right. I'm gonna, you're right. I I'm going to say you're trying to make jokes. To me. But no, those were my, like, yeah, that's like the hopeful part for me though, is like guys being dudes, guys ha- like having friends. Like I, it's a weirdly a nice movie about friendship as sad as it is. You know it what is? these, you know what these guys do have? You, they have a lot of charisma. Unlike, you know, people in some movies that we might've seen. Oh, uh, did we, did we both okay, see okay. the art gallery scene? Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah. I mean, not with women. <laughs> no, well, let's let's get to let's save the art gallery scene because I, I feel like woman. that's probably been flagged as a brilliant moment. as a woman. I flagged. The art uh, let's gallery get in. Scene. Oh, before we get into brilliant moments, last last and most important thing I almost forgot about the pedigree of this movie. It's got a Criterion spine number, number three eighty one. This is the first movie I had to watch on the Criterion channel because that was the place I found it. But apparently, it's also on. I watched it on Prime Video. Yeah. It's on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There you go. You you watched the it in French, right? I'm assuming. Is there another way to watch it? I think there's like an English dub. I I had to is. learn French for to watch it. <laughs> You're talking about French with no subtitles, right? Because I'm a film guy. I'm French now. Okay, let's get into some brilliant moments. Right right off the bat, the line about the man falling off the building. Yep. As he passes every floor, thinking so far so good. Like it's such a great such a great way to start the movie because ultimately they book in the movie with that with that quote right like the quote ends up it's not quite a book in because it's i don't know 15 minutes before the end of the movie but um but as as things are winding down we kind of revisit that line and what it means and and i just it's such a good i mean for lack of a better word catchy uh sort of theme for the movie c'est l'histoire d'un homme qui tombe d'un immeuble de 50 étages le mec au fur et à mesure de sa chute Il se répète sans cesse pour se rassurer. Jusqu'ici, tout va bien. Jusqu'ici, tout va bien. Jusqu'ici, tout va bien. Mais l'important, c'est pas la chute. C'est l'atterrissage. It's also vague enough that it completely encapsulates the ending without giving anything away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, because this movie, it's all about how it lands and what a landing. It also yeah. flagged to me, like, uh, starting that way and meeting the the main trio, for some reason, I just had in my head, I was like, one of them is going to die after that intro. One of them is going to land in a poor way. Uh, yeah. With those opening credits. If, if you think everybody's going to survive after those opening t- credits. It's a bleak movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, the movie literally starts with an image of of the Earth and a Molotov cocktail blowing the whole thing up, which is a very cool looking slow motion fire Dude, shot. Every, again, very going cool back looking. To, going I, back yeah. to like, you know, hey, give me a list of cool things right now and I'll put it in the movie. Every opening, every every shot in this like opening credit montage just looks like an album cover to Rage Against the Machine. Like I feel like if I saw this maybe in college, or like I would probably think it's the coolest movie of all time, specifically because of these opening credits. Like man, yeah. Hey well, Dan, I love hey Dan, when did you see the... this movie? <laughs> <laughs> I do love how casually the the uh, police are like just putting the the riot gear on their trucks. Like it yeah. feels so, so they're so nonplussed by like, all right, time to go, you know, time to go beat up some rioters. Like I thought they were just repurposing a camping grill. <laughs> it seemed like it. Something <laughs> doing something. If someone could grill a five dollar hot dog on that thing. Right, five five francs. Yeah. So I mean, this opening, uh, opening bit with the newsreel footage of I, you know, it it, it gives the whole thing a. It, it gives the whole thing this like rehearsed sort of feel. Like you, like I say, just sort of casually preparing for another riot, and here we go. And like the idea of here's the system that's in place, and we're just going about our. And there's even a handful of lines throughout the the movies, like we're just doing our job. We're just doing. I mean, we're just trying to do our job. So that I mean, that to me is where the hopelessness of it of it comes in, right? Is because everybody is just like, no, oh, this is just what I do. So well, that's what we I think that whole opening line means. So far, so good. Yeah. It feels like everyone is just going through the motions, especially that the main trio, because this is just their routine, just to kind of wander around aimlessly, causing trouble because they have yeah. nothing else and, to do. And ignoring the the idea that they're falling off a building. Yeah, you exactly. Know. They're just going with um, the going with the motions until they land. I do think that I mean that's the other thing too about that I think these three leads really nail and 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 also just like as watching the movie and watching this opening bit first with all of this, you know, archival footage, it, just the idea just how angry they are, right? They've got obviously there's plenty of reason to be angry, but it's it's so sort of inarticulate and unaimed like, you know, we know what we're angry about, but like where to direct it, what to do with it. Like those are harder questions to answer. And like, that's the thing that they see that they, the moments that I think uh, Vincent Cassell's character in particular has these moments where he's just like, he wants to be so angry and he wants to do these specific things. And when it comes down to it, he can't and he, or he won't, or he, he realizes they're not, that's not going to do anything like whatever it is. Um, it's just a fascinating portrait of, of just this like inarticulate rage uh, out of these three, three characters. But I think opening it on this archival footage so that like we see it, but also it does get, the movie does have a weird feeling about being like, we kind of start in the middle of things. Like it's just such a, such a window onto their lives um, that we don't really see the beginning or the, the end of it in a weird way, even though obviously it, the ending is pretty, pretty final, but I don't know. I feel like the movie is just con constantly falling off that building. Even after the end, it's still falling. Well, and this is one of the reasons why I really liked the uh, timestamps throughout the movie, because uh, yeah. otherwise I might have forgotten that this was all one day. And it's when you think about it, it's a pretty rough day. Their friend is in the hospital. He later dies. But that's a pretty earth shattering event for a teenage kid who just hangs out with his friends all day. Like when you mm -hmm. actually think about it that way in that context, it's like, shit, like they must be exhausted. <laughs> Like, and they're angry and yeah. they can't get home, which is another thing that like blew my mind as I was watching the movie. Like you can just get stuck somewhere. I'm so used to Ubering wherever I want to go, but like, no, they just get stuck. Not in 1995. Nope. I you mean, miss a train. You miss, you're done. Yep. Yep. This, there is no way that this movie wasn't going to do really, really well. Cause like its message is just like spot on. The fact that like this was going on in France at this time too. Right. And I mean, it's just like someone also mentioned like, one of one of our coworkers also mentioned, I think it was Tyle, who was just like, you know, this is, you know, French um do the right thing, right? And like all of that opening credit stuff, it's just this also like strikes a chord with anybody like anybody who was following like the Rodney King, like the Rodney King beating in like the early nineties. So like everything yeah. that is going on in that in this movie is directly applicable to America at that time. Well, I so, do I do hate how still relevant so much of it is like it, it, how many years like 30 years ago and it's like uh, yeah <laughs> like, no i this this movie might as well have been made today yeah like, Th i think that's why it, it also is... makes me so sad <laughs> it's like 
God yeah. Damn. Complete lack of progress. Yeah, complete lack of progress. That's yeah. what I'm saying. It's like. The majority of the flics in the Russian are not there to attack. They're there to protect you. When the clock becomes a motif, like they they cut away to the clock. This is why I, th I feel like the movie really found itself in the edit because they use it as as a gag sometimes. Like sometimes oh, yeah. the, the, there's once or twice where it, it progresses for like a minute or or, some, or they <laughs> use it to like they use it to they cut away to the clock just to like release some tension and then they cut back and they're like in a different location just kind of sitting quietly. You know, like it's an old SpongeBob um, SquarePants trick. They do that all the time. In SpongeBob, yeah, and it's funny exactly. every time. You mean every it's an old Lahane trick? Nope, they invented it. SpongeBob. Yeah. Sponge, SpongeBob. Uh, yeah. In terms of things that have been influenced by Lion, I think SpongeBob is right at the top of the list. At the top. Any any other specific moments early in the movie that you guys? Want to uh, honestly, all the Americana. That like you know we've talked about it a little bit, but like. This film does a great job using mise en scène, not only to establish its like American pop culture roots, and like not only is the filmmaker a fan of this, but the characters themselves, but also as a way to relay it, like to convey shorthanded information to the audience. So like when we meet Vincent Casal, he's like wearing a Spider-Man t-shirt. He's got a Brett the Hitman heart poster yeah. on on his poster uh, or on his wall, like all of that is just like, you know, kind of conveys like that alpha male kind of role. Well, not so much with Peter Parker, but you know, he's very into like the loner <laughs> hero. And then when you go to like, uh, Hugh Bear's room, he, I mean, a, he's a boxer, but like they have, he just has a ton Muhammad Ali imagery on his, on his walls. And like all of that stuff just like totally convey totally conveys their characters and then even later after like they're taking the train after he does the drug deal they pass by the sign that says the world is yours and they pass by it multiple times but that is also a that is also a scarface reference the thing that drew my attention to the world is you're saying like i might not have noticed it if i spoke french but the fact that they made a point to subtitle the sign well, they do that a lot. Like yeah. they did that with a lot of graffiti and and things like that. Like they they focused on, you know, the set deck, yeah. and you know, in a way that ma that made it worthy of subtitles. Yeah, because right? like, it, it's it, it's it's information that needed to be it's yeah. relevant information that needed to be conveyed to the audience and thus needed to be subtitled. And I just think like the yeah. way they did that was very smart and like yeah, it added so much depth and texture and understanding to these characters that I might not have understood otherwise. Well, and I think beyond just being Americana, I think it's, I look at Vince's room and I just think here is a teenage boy really trying to be cool. Like, or thinks mm -hmm. he's very cool, which is so relatable. Like he, his room almost looks like my teenage room. I mean, I'm not going to lie. The room is not what convinced me that was cool about Vince. Oh, he's it was the trying to be it, cool. was, it, oh, it was, oh, it was the Vince. Ring. There was, the <laughs> was it, the was it the, like the step, Print the step print crash zoom onto the the multi finger gold ring, you know. I can't yeah, want yeah, the, one of those. the little the little crash zoom in in onto the Vins uh, ring. That's another one of those in the long list of things that like that convinced me that that Matthew Kasovitz is trying real hard to be cool, to be honest. But in a, in a weird way, like it's stuff like that though that actually makes the movie hold up a little better for me, right? Because there's so much posturing. On the part of the characters, like, I mean, Vince, for example, like he literally wants to kill a cop so that he can get respect. And mm -hmm. he's just every, every step of the way, he's trying to be this tough guy and he, he knows what he wants to do and he's going to do it. And he's going to, he's not going to let anybody tell him that he's not going to, or that he's not a tough guy. And the way that these guys react to people when they're pressed, like it's all, it's all chest pounding stuff, you know? And so when you think about the stylistically, the movie just being this grab bag of cool stuff, you know, the black and white, first of all, which, it was shot in color, know, too, by the way, they that was a desaturate it. Yeah, I didn't look at it. I didn't see it. Yeah, that's so the choice is very clearly a choice. A to, it wasn't even no. like a Damn. Kevin Smith. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> even like a Kevin Smith can't afford color film in the early 90s. Kind of choice. It was, it was, like it was a thing. choice. Yeah, um, I assumed it was a budget thing. It was a I choice, actually, maybe after Clerks, because I do think that the way that this th th this pop culture thing, not in vibe but in imagery, does have a very Clerksy style 
like level of photography. Can I can I say a hot take? I would like to see the color version of this movie. I don't know if the black and white did it for me. Maybe you maybe we should just go back in time and try and sabotage this movie from the beginning because their whole plan apparently was that if it failed in black and white, they would re-release it in color. So it's like oh. the, it's like it's like the inverse Godzilla minus zero strategy, which is just right, like, hey, right. it worked in color. Here's the black and white the, version. The opposite justice yeah. is chrome yeah. or gray or whatever, uh Zack Snyder. Oh god. But like <laughs> That I mean, that is that is the funny thing too about I mean between you know the, the posturing of the characters on screen and I think and frankly the posturing of the filmmaking style like I mean it, so there's the um, the mirror scene the taxi driver scene like that is such a complicated way to shoot that scene yeah right because that's clearly a double that's and smart. then they're they're okay yeah well see but. <laughs> Yeah, they so pan past the double. It's not a mirror. They did yeah. the Linda yeah. Hamilton twin sister thing. Yep. Um, specifically so that he could be looking in the mirror directly at us. And like, I don't know that this scene needs. I think this scene works just as well without the direct address. It, it might. But the way that they it, I mean, it's cool, right? It is. It is cool. But it's cool in a way that is like, here's a choice that I'm making to be cool. And like, it's more posturing. The whole movie is is like thumping its chest at you um, in in a way that I think helps it hold up. Really. But they spent budget on that, right? Like they had to make a double yes, set because it's not like they shot that on location. I think it's really, really interesting too, to your point, right, of where they – where they decide to flex cinematically. Because there's also the dolly zoom when they're standing on that balcony, like yep. right – Right, right when they get to like, I think like downtown Paris, that was also mm -hmm. just like, whoa, <laughs> like this is cool. Well, and that was that was one of the moments where they they do the they do the dolly zoom, um, and then they cut to time ticking ticking by, and then they cut back and they're still just standing there. Yeah, <laughs> which, is, which is this. I and I think like thematically the point of the movie, like we talked about, you know, going back and forth between you know, the issues that the movie's dealing with thematically. And then the fact that these guys are just buddies, essentially, like they won't, you we cannot forget that these are just kids, guys but that, dudes. so like doing this combination of a dramatic push in jaws style dolly shot, and then a snap cut to them just kind of standing there and one of them spits and like, it, you know, so like, it's, it's that combination of, of the dramatic stuff with them just standing around. Uh, that's even living within that one little sequence, one little three shot sequence. And that's also why I, I'm a little hung up on the black and white too. Cause I feel like it looks so much more artful just because it's black and white, but I feel like it would have been a little more gross yeah. and weird in color. I don't yeah. know. And that it does. It, it's got a little bit of like Truffaut, like 400 blows vibes to it. You know, it's just like yeah. kind of like coming of age, you know, French new wave kind of feel the new, new wave, I guess. But back to the mirror scene, that's where I was, that's the moment where I was like, oh, this guy is not a tough guy. If we were supposed to think he's a tough guy, he is doing taxi driver in the mirror. He looks real silly. It's a, it's a big performance. Yeah. You know, to say the least. But then but like, fun. I think you, you also mentioned something earlier, uh, Cal, about the wire. Um, and early on in the, in the movie, there's a lot of, uh, there's a one take that's some steady cam stuff. That's like a two minute long take of them walking through several different sort of courtyards and back roads and yeah. And you get you get a real feel for where they live, right? Yeah. And where in the environment, and then like the way that it's staged, really, frankly, brilliantly, um, because they they build pauses into their to their to like so that the camera can kind of move around them, and the way that it's it's paced and staged, and and it creates different little vignettes all within the one two minute steady cam shot. Uh, it's very cool, and then it's followed immediately up by the grilling on the rooftop thing, which that's only a couple of shots. Um, you know, and it's to the point where, and they're not excessively long, but they're long enough. And then they're, they create, they float around to all these different spaces, just skillfully enough that you forget that they haven't cut for like 90 seconds. Yeah. I mean, budget, bro. And that's kind of yeah. what I love about it. You know, when like these low budget, and I bet you that sky was blown out in the, in the color print and, but it looks better in black and white. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, don't get me started on blow. Don't get me started on blown out skies. Oh, we. You know what we need to talk about. Uh, while we're while we're sort of on the topic of camera work, anyway, is that drone shot? Yeah, dude. Whatever how did they get that? Did anybody look up anything on that? Because like I, I was I found one thing. There's a company. Uh, 
I can't remember what the company was called now. It was like Copter Cam or something like that. But it was basically an early drone. Drone, right? And it was like, uh, yeah. And it was a fixed fixed uh, mount on it. And they had to kind of steer it. And and it's it's wobbly. Like, it doesn't look great. But it's not a crane. And it's not, um, you know, it's not like it's on what they so, hung wires between all those buildings or anything like that. But it is, as far as I can tell, a really early version of a drone. So, like, what'd they do? Like, they get, like, one of those, like, RC helicopters? Because, like, I mean, Basically, they, they yeah. existed. And, like, that's wild. You can't throw a 35 millimeter camera on one of those things, can you? Like, they had to, no, like, I, they I, had to shoot this in, like, 16. It looks great. Well, I will say, like, in yeah. this this isn't a criticism i like this it's kind of like shaky too which i think adds to it it's it's wobbly for sure like it's not a great looking shot but like it is it works <laughs> you it, cannot it absolutely works. i don't want to see a smooth version yeah, of this i like i don't models. understand like it, it, it's just like and you know to the to the point of like we feel like we've seen this all before and this is just like a an unfortunate reality of us recording this podcast in 2024 uh, almost 30 years after this movie was made and cheap drones are everywhere. But that that is like a legitimate, that shot is a legitimate accomplishment Oh yeah, for a yeah. low budget independent foreign film in 1994. Yeah. The boss. Yeah. No, it's great. Yeah. And that's the, that's the kind of thing that this movie, that this movie does. It's the same deal with the mirror shot, right? It's like, there are other ways around it, but they're like, no, we're going to, we're going to, I mean, these are, these are lamp bumps. I was going to say, shots, it sounds like a lamp know? up to me. It's a lamp bump that, you know, we're going to do this the hard way, even if it's not perfectly smooth or crisp or whatever that works with the story that they're telling. Yeah. And like it, the fact that the seams show a little bit, I again, I think is one of the reasons why the movie holds up better. Oh, yeah. It, I feel like if it were smooth, it wouldn't feel right. I feel like it would just it, like it's supposed to feel a little janky and cheap. It would be smooth right now. Oh, my God. It so would if be. they were if they were to remake this movie, it would it some would be some studio smooth. exec would be like, hey. Straighten that out. There would also be more than one. Yeah, or uh, <laughs> Jamie would be like, "You want to borrow my drone?" Um, and it's a surprising shot too. It is surprising. It's like out of nowhere at that point. Now, yeah, even watching it now, at you know, thirty years on, and with this kind of technology, is you know, anybody can get it. You can get it at Best Buy. But like when they pulled away from the window, I was like, "Ooh, what's this?" And then they started moving, looking down, and then panning up. And it just up, kept and going, like, oh, and I was like, "Ooh." Let's yeah. Like, yeah, let's take a little ride. Well, it works great too because it, you know, finding doing it just for the sake of doing it is one thing, but like here we've got this DJ who's he's got music going out of his window and then this is following the music out and across the courtyard and amongst all these other buildings and here are all the people that are going to see it or, or listen or hear it. And then we catch up with our main characters again, who are also listening to it. Like it's, it, it, it serves a purpose. Uh, it's not just like, Hey, here's a fun thing. Like here's a weird flex. Like it serves, it's a flex that serves a purpose. You know what my favorite part about this guy is, and this is like one of my favorite parts in the movies. This is, I've lived in densely populated cities for a while. But I have never heard anybody ever heckle someone for being loud on the street. And that is just like a thing in movies. And this DJ, like, like this DJ is apparently so good at what he does. And he rightfully is that like, there's just not some old guy being like, hey, shut the up. I'm trying to sleep yeah. over it. Like there is every yeah. other time yeah. somebody like, yells on the street. Every other time someone yells out in the street in this movie, they get heckled. <laughs> yeah. Well, also what I love about this guy is he like, before he starts playing, he like adjusts his hat and gets ready. He takes it so seriously. Like he almost seems a little bit oh, nervous, yeah. even though you know he does this all the time. Like this no, is No, he's an does. artist for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I love him. I wanted more of him. Also the sound, I, I, I can't get over how good the soundtrack, this like 90s French rap. I just want to get like, back into street heckling. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna say '90s French yeah. rap, but it's also Cypress Hill though, and Lovey and Rose, I think, right? That's the that's the uh, Inception. Inception, another movie that owes a lot to Lion. Clearly, that was that was another joke. Sorry. Oh, I th I thought we weren't doing jokes because this is the dry episode. No, I keep trying to do jokes, and I regret it every time. What other brilliant moments you got? Most of mine aren't in the beginning. I think the first one that I really flagged that someone else also flagged 
was the old guy in the bathroom. Like, Are we getting the old guy in yeah. the bathroom? Is that, am I jumping let's too far? Let's talk about, nah, nah, let's, yeah. let's talk talk about, about it. it. No, no. So they all, they, they, they're they yelling at each other in a bathroom. Uh, all And again, it's like the central issue with this movie is like, you know, uh, Vince has decided that if their friend who has been hospitalized by uh, police brutality, uh, if he ends up dying, then Vince is going to kill a cop. Like that's the central conflict of this. They're sort of waiting around to see if he dies so that Vince knows like, I'm going to take one of theirs out soon. And they're arguing about that in this bathroom, screaming at each other. And then all of a sudden this old guy just pops out of a stall saying like, I love a good shit. <laughs> Which is, <laughs> you guys ever just taken a nice shit? Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. This incredibly like diminutive figure just comes strolling out and of just a owns stall. the room though. The way he just immediately yep. commands the room and he has, they have no idea what to do. <laughs> <laughs> He's so Which tiny. is even better. What do you, what do, you and do? It, and it keeps getting better yeah. throughout the scene because the scene ends with another guy poking his head out of the stall, being <laughs> like, like he was scared to come out this whole time. But this old dude's just like, I love taking a good shit. And he just <laughs> owns the room, is the best way to put it. Absolutely. And they just, they're silent. But no, the story he, tell, he tells too, I, I was thinking about it because I know Saeed, like after the guy leaves the room, Saeed's like, why did he tell us that? Why did he tell yeah. us that? To me, it was so obvious why he told them that. And it was like, really? You think your lives are bad? My friend died pooping outside of a train. But of course, like, they don't get that. And I love that they don't get that just because they're such silly little teenage boys. Like, that is so humanizing to me. That makes so much sense. The idea that the guy died because he gave him such a... He was giving his friends so much of a hard time about being shy about shitting in front of each other on a, on a train to a work camp in Siberia. Like he was still, he was, he was making fun of his friend in those circumstances to the point where his friend ended up freezing because he couldn't, he couldn't, he had to go behind a bush to take a shit. And then he was too embarrassed to keep his, he had to keep his pants up and he couldn't even reach out to save himself because he was so embarrassed because this guy was making fun of him. And like, to, to drop that story on these guys who are giving each other such a hard time in their circumstances, is in, it's incredible. It's such a funny, weird tangent of a story that ends up, I mean, again, it's how you land, right? He lands mm. the story in such a, such a hilarious, not hilarious way, but such, a, such an impactful way. And then for Saeed to be like, wait, why did he tell us that? It's, it's great. <laughs> Because you you can tell that it you can tell that it lands on Hubert and Vince in in a meaningful way the way that the guy intended, uh, or at least it give, they know that it gives them something to think about. Mm -hmm. And Saeed is just Saeed, who by the way I love this guy. I also love he's, Saeed. He's so he's so much fun. The only one of the three that actually kind of annoys me sometimes is Vince. The other two, although I I like Vince as a character, but the other two consistently delight me. I'm just looking at. I have a, I have a question for you. How do you think they got the shot where, like, when they split up, right? And Vin and Vin Vin's is hanging out with those other dudes, and then they shoot up the club, and it's like over the shoulder. Is that, I I think that's technically a diopter shot, right? Like in Jaws, where you're like looking. You're talking like, about when it's close up, like on the, the close up of Vin's on the left side of frame. Yeah, and then and then you see the guy shooting, shooting up the club the, on the the right uh, side. Yeah, and it's totally in focus. Like everything is in focus. I don't know if that was a dioptic lens or if it was uh, super. Like it feels like it might have been superimposed. Like the face was just done was in post separately. Yeah, it it felt it felt more of a garbage mat kind of like you. Yeah, it felt like more. It was more for dramatic effect than it was for he was actually watching them do it. Well, he's deliberately not watching them do it. His back is turned to him. That's what. But it's such a great shot. Is that how? It, is that yeah. how it's set up? Yeah, it's yeah. It, it's literally like the jaw shot where you know, like Roy Scheider is like talking to that woman, right? And then like looking past at the water as well, and you can kind of see like the woman being attacked, like the girl being attacked. So there's those lenses. There's the lenses that um, they have two. They're split in half vertically. And they have two focal lengths, right? And usually, yeah, okay. So you can see you can see the line kind of right just to the outside of his ear, like yeah. his shoulders out of focus. Yeah, because that half of the frame is usually like what happens is they'll find something in. It might have been the door, the door frame or something like that. But usually, what they do is they'll find something in the production design on set 
to like hide that focus line. I, the, for some reason, the example that I always think of is in uh, All the President's Men. And Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman are sitting in the foreground at their desk and there's a pole right next to them in the newsroom. And everything behind the pole is in focus as well. But they hide the focus line on, on the, the pole. pole. But you can usually spot it. Like when it's done poorly, it's it just jumps straight out at you. It's just it's just another one of those subtle flexes. It's also what made it so hard. Like it this scene in particular, when I'm talking about like scenes that made me sad, I think that scene was the hardest to watch for me. And it is because of that of that close up on Vin's while that's happening. It it just reminds you that he's like a yeah, he's just a kid who was trying so hard to be tough and he's so freaking scared. Like, that's what makes this so sad to me. Absolutely. I mean, and you need for his arc in the movie, you need this scene. Oh, yeah. 100%. Um, it's great. Can we also, speaking about Vins and feeling sorry for him, can we talk about the cow real quick? You know, all I kept on thinking about that is like if you ever went to Universal Studios and they had that Twister ride, and then I remember when I was a little kid, they had the cow that like kind of went around, but I never saw the cow. So like my mom was like, "Did you see the cow?" And I was just like, "No, I didn't." Cow doesn't exist. What are yeah. you talking about? I I totally I totally empathize with Saeed on this because I never saw the cow. Yeah, like what are you talking about? What cow? So apparently he saw a cow the night before during the riots, and then he sees it again later in the movie. And it's unclear if it's actually there or not. Like, cause Saeed doesn't, he doesn't care. He's like, yeah, whatever, shut up about your cow. And then later on, he kind of makes fun of him for like, oh, you're just the guy that sees cows everywhere or, or something along those lines. So like, I don't know, is the cow real? I think I'm a cow truther. <laughs> I think the cow is real. You're a cow truther? I think I, yeah. I think I am. I don't know. Good. Are you not? Do you think the cow is fake or imagined? Hmm. No, I think it's real. Yeah. There's nothing to. I think it's, eh, I think it's real. I don't know. They do a lot of fake gunshots, right? Like when he fake when he fake shoots that cop on the side of the road after he learns that uh, what do you call died. So there is, there is yeah. the no. There's there's precedent for some yeah. heightened reality because uh, and also before we even meet Vens, like the first time we see him is I think in his dream, like when he's dancing right there before Saeed wakes him up. Uh, the first time we we meet him. So yeah, there's there's precedent in the movie for some some sort of weird heightened reality, but I do feel like the cow is real for some reason. Well, I, I here's why I think the cow is real is because there's so much chaos in this area, and there is like even though everyone's kind of going through the motions on their own routine, there is no real routine. So for me, it makes total sense in this area at this time with all the riots for someone to let their cow loose and to no one, yeah, yeah, not know what to do with the cow. That a cow would just randomly show up in yeah. the middle of Tracks the Paris it. suburbs. What do you think of the name of French cow? Like, uh, like Bessie, but French. Like, yeah, yeah what, what is, is Bessie French, French of Bessie? for Bessie? Yeah, <laughs> Amelie. <laughs> Probably <laughs> Amelie. Yeah. The scene where they go to buy drugs. Uh, we want to talk about how this movie feels endlessly familiar, but I understand that it is wholly original. Like. The scene where they, I think it's the drug dealer, right? Where they go to like Hugh Bear's This is the one where dealer. they go to the, they go into Paris, into the, yeah. the, the good, the nice neighborhood. And, and the guy and, not wearing a shirt that looks like yeah. he would be the front man of a grunge band in the nineties. Like, you know. Right. And he's got nunchucks. And yeah. So much reminded me of like the Alfred Molina scene in good er, in Boogie Nights. Oh yeah. And I just can't help but wonder if that scene was a reference for that for boogie nights because it touches on all the same beats like they're there yeah. their sure main characters was, are there they're uncomfortable being there there's a guy who is feeling extremely comfortable and garish in his own home that like just and on cocaine yeah and on cocaine and it's just doing the only thing it's missing is the other guy in the room yeah that there's like a the in boogie nights they, there's a that younger guy who's just kind of off to the side and he's a guy who's like very much on cocaine and very dangerous also very good with nunchucks. I don't think I could be that good with nunchucks not on cocaine. Oh, no, no. Yeah, that's the kind of nunchuckery that you need to be high on cocaine for. I think. This For all the Americana that's in this movie, I feel like there were some French references that I was missing when they were talking about his name, Asterix. And when they were like trying to intercom him, someone made a joke that was like, do you mean Obel? I was like, that might be funny if I knew French stuff. No, yeah, those are two, two characters that do... In fact, I think I, 
I can't remember where I saw in, I was looking up somebody's uh, resume and asterisk and obelisk were on their uh, IMDb page. I can't remember who it was now, but. Well, if someone so in some, the comments want to explain that lore, I'll, I'll read it. Yeah, I will happily read it. <laughs> I, I, I want to make sure we talk about the carjacking scene because again, it's one of my favorites just because it was one of those comic relief uh scenes but more important than that the guy outside the window surprised me so much because i feel like or at least i thought he was going to be someone who was working against them because it feels like everyone is against them at this point and he was trying to help them. His he wife, did help he, them. He did. Oh my god! He he's such yeah, a real one. He yeah, jumped on the police, police car. car to help them. I'm like, I, like that was so. It like it kind of just like brought my spirits back up, and them just fighting amongst each other. It's one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Just comic relief. Not yeah. everyone's bad. Some people will jump no, on a police funny. car and, for and, you. And, and him, him going like, no, 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 Saeed's right. And Saeed's like, see, I'm right. <laughs> like, like he's some sort of authority on it. <laughs> no, that was a great scene. Shortly after that scene, there, uh, it's, it's a moment where Vin's actually opens up a little bit for the first time. Uh, they're on the rooftop uh, smoking, and I think he says something about how he feels like an ant lost in intergalactic space, uh, which... <laughs> is such a you know that's such a high person thing to say <laughs> you know that, that, <laughs> that is a, a high person thing to say you know in that context it's just like yeah no i i mean who hasn't gotten high and felt like an ant in the intergalactic who space but also like the fact that he admits to feeling small in any way at all in that moment and it's on the heels of this sequence of them like they leave the, they go to the art gallery everything that happens which by the way we skipped over the scene where the cops have them and they're like teaching a rookie cop how to torture people oh. basically is what it is what it feels yeah. like yeah that was a tough scene that's yeah. that, that scene was you know and to talk about a movie that bounces back and forth between stuff like that and then they meet up at the train station and then they're buddies again and they end up going to an art uh an art show trying to pick up chicks and like the way that this movie is able to bounce back and forth between stuff like that is is wild but basically that whole sequence after they meet back up at the train station after they've been through all of this, you know, and then to wrap that up with Vin's actually admitting to feeling a little vulnerable or to feeling small or to feeling lost in and purposeless, I guess, uh, it was a really good moment. And it's shot over, it's shot from behind the two of them. Like you don't see him say it, you know, they're just sitting on a rooftop and city lights in the distance. And it's, it's, a, it was a really great moment. And that was right towards the end, about an hour 20 into the movie, into the, to the movie. And I, for as much as, as much as I've talked about how bleak this movie is, it's one of those moments that was like, all you need is friends sometimes. All you need sometimes is just to smoke some weed with your buddies on a roof, even if everything sucks and you just got tortured by police. Like, it's going to make it a little better if you just got your buddies. You also get a little higher when, you're on, when you smoke weed on a roof. <laughs> That's also a lesson you could take from that. <laughs> it's heightened. Um... <sighs> Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> hard oh, transition. No jokes. We, I, I no want to circle. I want to circle back to Cal saying they have charisma or charm because we haven't talked about the art gallery. Oh scene. yeah, no. Oh, that was hard to watch. Like, and I, I, I love this. I think I love Hubert who, has it. I mean, no, he, Hubert. He, yeah. and he, he was trying to do him a solid. Yeah. But they didn't discuss beforehand that Saeed was supposed to be shy, which I think was a misstep. I think Hubert is the only one with game, also, because Saeed just. He's goes also the and, boxer. Yeah, you know? exactly, and he's I would say the most attractive of them, in my humble opinion. And like, no, it's just so hard to watch. And again, you just get the idea that like, oh, they're just they're just trying to fit in. They're just poor teenagers trying to hit on chicks and have friends. Also, they're just street kids just trying to like. It's also like a really good like they don't fit in with the bourgeois. Well, you can tell. I mean, yeah. just like again, <laughs> they're just scuffed up. They've been wandering around. Yeah, two of them night. have been beaten up by cops. Yeah. So yeah, Saeed's even got a, like a big fresh bruise on his yeah. on his cheek and this mm -hmm. whole thing. But yeah, no, the it, it, <laughs> my takeaway from this was was how funny it was that like Hubert goes in, he gets the way, and he's like, oh, my buddy's shy, you know, and come, and, and then Saeed comes over, he's like, all right, let's do it, like. <laughs> We're going to do it, right? You want to talk? Talk about what? We don't need to talk. Like, 
that was it was such a funny what would we um, talk about i think oh what God, would we talk so about bad. yeah whatever it is it was, it was great <laughs> It was, it it was just such a laugh, such though. a charming such a charming like crash and fail uh, kind of kind of moment for a side, but it's so it's so I don't want to say it's endearing because he's such a, he's such a dick in it, but it's like oh yeah no that's not it like that's what I would yeah. expect you to do also though same guy who didn't understand the poop on the train story is also the same guy who is gonna <laughs> just <laughs> screw up the the layup that Hubert laid for him. <laughs> but and then again like how mad they get just immediately so mad so they get mad. so mad and they flip tables and on their way out and uh like them leaving this is i don't know it's such a funny moment and then they they all just get pissed immediately um it's like you screwed this up my guy you had it like he <laughs> laid it out for you you have no one but yourself to blame for this the ending the ending in this film so is i mean it's it's rough Mm -hmm. It's right. Like as you know, the, I feel like they've all, they, they've gotten back home, you know, they've gotten, uh, Vins and Hubert are, you know, they're on, they kind of understand each other again. They're back on the same page. It seems like, you know, to the point where Vins even hands, hands over the gun and they kind of smile. And, and I think Saeed is there. He's like, what are you guys going to kiss and make up to or something like that? Like he's, everything is back to sort of a good, a good keel for these guys. Right. Um, and then, which by the way, what a great piece of wardrobe, this Notre Dame jacket. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Like it's such a, such a perfect piece of wardrobe for this, for this cop. So you immediately recognize it as soon as he's back on camera every time. In general, by the way, I think the wardrobe department cu killed it. Like it's the, all, all the costumes and clothes like are perfect. And if they shot this in color, I bet that Notre Dame jacket is bright green for the same reason. But man, it's just a great piece of wardrobe for this for this shithead of a cop. So they're just screwing with these, these guys. The cops show up and they just they're screwing with him again, and he accidentally shoots Vins in the in the head. And you can tell immediately he knows he messed up yeah. a lot. But that's kind of what's kind of great about this and what makes this ending work so well is because it's like the double reverse on the uh, character arcs, right? So, like, the, the moment between Hubert and Vins where Vins gives him the gun is the culmination of Vins' character arc, right? He realizes that violence isn't the answer, and he relinquishes the gun in order to, in order to move on, right? So he has his catharsis. And Hubert's whole thing the entire movie was like, he was just kind of the middleman in this. And he was just like, I'm just trying to get out and violence. Isn't the way that's going to get me out. It isn't going to get me out of, out of, out of this neighborhood. And so he relinquishes the gun. The cops come accidentally shoots Vins. And now Hugh bear is drawn to the same irrational anger or rational anger. I should say, right. That Vins yeah. has been feeling the, in, the entire film. So he just, being on the other side of the spectrum in the span of like 25 seconds comes all the way back, like does a complete 180 and is the film ends at a moment where he is in the exact opposite position of he, where he yep. was when he started it, just like Vince, just all the, and there, the, this is where the hopelessness comes in, right? Yeah. Like all the work that they did yeah, um, and the journey that they've been on just gone and then to die in the end you know because he yeah. does there's no bullets in that gun i i i said at the beginning that i knew one at least one of them was gonna die i don't think that's a huge deduction i kind of assumed once hubert started talking about how badly he wanted to get out that it was gonna be hubert vins makes total sense though i feel like he was kind of the glue almost holding them together like at some point they arrest saeed and say he was the leader which i think is a hilarious miscalculation i think it was always vins but the just juxtaposition between Hubert and Vins is that Hubert's response in this in this scene is totally understandable. Like again, to the timestamps, they've had a day. They have not slept. They've been running around, getting lost, trying to carjack stuff, getting tortured by police. And then your friend dies at the end after your other friend died, because they learned before this that their friend died in the hospital. It makes yeah. so much sense to me that that's what would make you yeah. snap. Like and also, and that's the thing. It's like there's, there's, you know, the reason to be angry is so obvious 
but it's like what to do with that anger is the is the harder question to answer you know it's which is which is why this movie is still so absolutely relevant one one last thing i also want to say the guy in the notre dame jacket what a performance he oh yeah he plays the whoops <laughs> like yeah, i dropped he even he, chuckles a yeah like, like there's a he, little oh, the little nervous laughter. He, yeah. he does yeah. it like i dropped an egg in the kitchen and it cracked right. on the floor <laughs> and it's just like yeah whoop so, sorry yeah so it's a uh, well and and that's and that energy too is like part of yeah. what makes this ending so devastating it's yeah just like, it's so he doesn't good care yeah you know you like we've just lived with an entire day and night with these guys and we see what they go through and we see what they value and, and how they care about, you know, their friends. Uh, and then for the, for a cop to just not be like, Oh, <laughs> my, uh, my bad. Um, you know, it's, it's tough, man. This, the well, also, ending of this movie is tough. And Saeed's face, which I like paused on to ponder on. And then I went to bed sad. Um, like to me, that just says like some kind of exhaustion or being fed up. Like it's he's like straining. Jusqu'ici, tout va bien. L'important c'est pas la chute. Well, it's how we it's how we meet him too, right? We meet him standing there with his eyes closed, looking at the line of cops before he does the graffiti on the back of the cop car in the very beginning of the movie. Yeah. And so, like his his story is bookended by just standing there with his eyes closed. God, yeah. I mean, I think it's just again to the hopelessness. <laughs> like nothing was ever gonna change. Ah. Mm -hmm. oh. It made me sad. <laughs> Look at him talking about like, it. <laughs> Whoops. It's, yeah, it's, that, that that's the intended smirk. effect. But, yeah, it's uh, the smirk, yeah. man, that gets me every time. Yeah. And he just seems like he doesn't even seem that mad at Hubert either. Like, I think he knows he made a big mistake. Yeah, probably knows he's going to get away with it, too. You want to talk about movie lists or like, what are we doing here? <laughs> I'm just sad now. I don't know. I know. Right. It's, it, oh. it's, it's a really moving film. It, it really is. It um, is. But let's talk about movie lists. So we, we talked to, um, this movie was on the top nine movies of the nineties that we top did. nine. I oh, remember. I get why you did that. <laughs> yeah we did one from every year i think there's 10 years in the 90s so clearly not it was a leap decade <laughs> yeah one of those decades that has one less year yeah. but it was our pick for the uh european film from the 90s Ooh. Uh, oh. which is feels bold because there's a lot of good that is movies bold. out of out of europe in the 90s but there you go and i i mean i know it's been mentioned plenty because that's how i learned how to pronounce it I, that's the that's the one pick, the one main pick that I could find. But I know it's gotten several honorable mentions. But are there any other movie lists that you would you would put this movie on? We we do a list based on the country. Ooh, top ten French, French, movies? French yeah, movies. just French movies. We've talked we've talked about doing something similar, the, like sort of a world tour kind of yeah, uh, yeah. kind of series, which I, I would imagine French has done enough that we would need two or three episodes to to cover it, but. Um, because this would definitely be up uh, there on the, done. this would definitely be up there on the French, you know, like, yeah, I definitely think that this is very much a nineties take on like the French new wave kind of thing. And, uh, mm -hmm. I, it's very successful at it. I'm trying to think of a list. Yeah. That would like pull together how young all the actors are. Like these are none of their debuts really. I don't know. No. Yeah. I do think that this is another movie that is a vote for making a top 10, like forever relevant movies. Yeah. Uh, like this movie could end up on a list with, you know, uh, with being there was one that we talked about recently. Um, that's still super relevant or sunset Boulevard, you know, like I, I think you could put this movie side by side with those in, in those terms or like day in the life movies. Yeah. Oh Ooh, yeah. That's a good one. Movies That'd probably like in be the one only day. way that, yeah, yeah. That's probably be the only way that Lion and and The Breakfast Club could end up on the same movie movie list. <laughs> Wait, that's um, a fun list. That's how I should start. That's how we should start programming movie lists. Pick two <laughs> movies that you don't think are related, and then find figure out what they common. relate them, yeah. and then find eight other movies that fit that mold. <laughs> uh, no, but yeah, you put The Breakfast Club and Before Sunrise and Lion. You know, the standard triple feature. Um, <sighs> Super bad, I guess, too, would go in there. <laughs> Super bad. I mean, honestly, I sort of talked myself into to a day in the life movie list. That'd be that'd be good. I dig that.
Also, I will say it's borderline more depressing to like watch it in America. The fact that they had one gun and that caused the stir there's that it multiple, did. Yeah. There's multiple guns in there. Don't well, forget the, they, they the, shot like, out no, the club. But they, the, the whole thing was that a cop lost a gun and someone got the a gun. A cop and, lost a yeah. gun. A way, single plot, gun. Plot line in the wire as well, just you know, to connect the dots there between. Shall we torf? Let's torf. All right. Let's we'll torf it. lighten the mood a little bit. Okay. We touched on this one a little bit. Lane was shot in color, then converted to black and white, which we talked about. During the 10-year anniversary of the film, special screenings of the color version were held. I'm going to go true. I'm going to say false. I'm going to go true. They needed something new. It's false. Uh, it was, as we discussed, shot in color, but never screened. The director, Ma- I, I'm going to say his name, Matthew... The director yeah. uh, said when the you director. look up <laughs> the director, <laughs> the filmmaker, uh, when you look at black and white footage from the war, it changes when you see that footage put in color. It, basically, he was saying it's really expensive, but it doesn't cost anything to make it look good in black and white. If I showed you Lion in color, it's horrible. OK, another dwarf. True or false. Vincent Castle's brother is part of the rap group behind the French F- the police song featured in this movie. True or false. God, I hope Ooh. that's false. <laughs> I, <laughs> I do i did stumble across the fact that vincent cassell's brother is a rapper um so i don't was know he that, this rapper? i don't know if they did yeah i don't know if he's this particular rapper what was his name his name was something like uh like squat thrust or something like that <laughs> um, no really oh my god that makes it even more <laughs> it was it was something yeah go ahead i'm gonna go i'm gonna go true but reserving the right to be upset if it's if it's like he's a rapper, but he didn't write this song. I'm 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 saying I'm saying false. It's it's true. You're real. What would you, what did you say his name was? Uh, rock like a <laughs> s- squat like thrust. Squat thrust? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, he went by Rock and Squat. Sorry, that, uh, rock, rock and Squat. squat. Was rock, you were really close. Yeah. You were really close. Uh, so you're no, saying Squat Thrust is still available? Squat, I can use that for mine. <laughs> no, I like Squat okay, Thrust good. better. I'm a little disappointed that that's Great. not what Rock it is. and Squat. <laughs> <laughs> no, the music of the film was handled by French hardcore rap group Assassin. And yes, Rock and Squat is one of the members of that. So, Brother to Vincent Cassell. Yes. So yes. like, because like Vincent Cassell is not, did not grow up poor. <laughs> you know, like. That's one of the things I found while I was looking it up is, is the director specifically did not grow up poor, but his friends did. I think it's something like that where he grew up in Paris, slightly privileged, but he always went outside to like the projects to hang out with his friends, which I found really interesting. Not a tour. Because like but. Vincent Cassell's dad was an actor that has a pretty extensive IMDb. Vincent Cassell, yet another Nepo baby. Yeah, he's got like his, <laughs> Vincent Cassell's dad's got 212 IMDb credits as an actor. Oh, so he's uh, working. Yeah, yeah, he's a working guy. Yeah, our producer Francesca wrote Vincent Cassell Nepo baby in the doc, so yeah. you're not wrong. Nepo baby. All right, so I got that one right? Yeah. And I'm 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 gonna give I'm gonna give r- squat thrust to you because that was a real squat close. thrust is I mean that's now I think officially my twerf uh, alter ego. And as soon as we get into this segment, I'm gonna turn into squat. You're thrust no longer Clint. You are squat thrust. Squat thrust. Um, true or false? <laughs> I'm gonna go with true. Torf. Uh, Vincent Cassel uh, ha- was underage during the production of La Hine and had to have his mommy accompany him on set. In the documentary titled Ten Years of Lahaine, uh, Cassil reveals his mom screamed at him on set during the filming of the final scene. He, she might have screamed at him, but he was pushing 30 when this movie was made. He, yeah, he was, he was in his so late 20s. So he was not underage. Said was in his early 20s, 2021, 20, something like that. But So based on the beginning of that sentence, true or false, he, he was underage. That is false. That is false. But did his mommy scream at him at some So is that what the true or false? What, what, what am I truing or falsing here? All because. <laughs> well, so then it's I'm just asking you, so, if so, you. I'm asking you as a human if you think his mom yelled at him. Well, no, no, no. Because you also said oh. that he was underage. I think his mom just. I think yeah. his mom might have. I'm going to go true. His mom yelled at him, but not because he was underage. He was underage. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with Clint there. It's all false. Oh. Um, I don't think his it's mom yelled false. at him on set. Oh, wait. There's a. This movie, uh, well, he while he was playing a teenager, the he was Google 28 years old. Getting updated <laughs> live. <laughs> his mother did yell. <laughs> so we were right. His mother did Francesca yell. Francesca just wrote this movie is, was yeah. hard. <laughs> but he was uh, he was overage. Uh, this is a tough, was, a tough tour uh, assignment. Overage, yeah, a tough tour of assignment. He was overage. <laughs> He had a, he had a horizontal license at the time. He was 28 years old, and I, as far as we know, his mommy did not yell at him on set. Okay, so it was just all completely okay. fabricated. Yes, all a lie. That was a double false. Well, listen, 
uh, now that I'm no longer squat thrust, uh, I feel like we can move on. With I the... miss him. I miss him already. <laughs> Yeah, who's your MVP, guys? I, I do want to say that it's Kasovitz just because anytime a director also has his hands on the edit to the point where he gets a credit for it, that gets a lot of bonus points for me. Because I again, like I do really feel like, particularly with how the clock uh, runner was worked in, I do really feel like this movie found a lot of its energy in the edit. But I also want to say Hubert. That, those were my two, and I was debating between them. Yeah, I think I'm, I think I came out Hubert. I think Hubert's energy. I mean, it grounds the thing in a way that that, that you know he's he's got a cooler head than the other guys. Like he knows that he wants to get out. Um, he's like, you know, and it shows in all the choices that he makes. And that's a that's a a that's an energy that the movie really needs because otherwise it would have just been a lot of yelling, you know. And so I think without him there. I don't think the movie's quite the same. Uh, as good as Vince and Saeed are, um, I think without the energy that Hubert brought, like they're not as good. I'm going to go Vince. I, I think Vince Gasol. Because I, I think this is like the movie that kind of like catapulted him to international fame. Side note, I love that they all have their real names in the movie. Looking at, looking at, looking at Vince Gasol's IMDb page, it's, it's kind of small stuff up until this. And then like... I don't know. He's the only person I knew going into this movie and his career after this is just huge. And I think that this is the thing that put him on the map. I mean, Sa Saeed and Vincent both work, work more or less constantly ever since this movie. And, and I, I mean, all, too. all like, of them have not underplaying how good he is in this, but I think this movie did more for him than he did for the movie. That's fair. Yeah. Oh. Because you're right, it did catapult him to, to stardom after this. But that's what we're asking, who won the movie, right? So, yeah. not a Bond villain, but he was a Jason Bourne villain. He was a Jason Bourne villain. That's He's true. He's got a, such a good and villain an face. Ocean's 12 villain. All that to say, I think I'm going to go back and give it to Cassavitz. It's weird because like the fact that he hasn't done anything that's quite lived up to it since, it feels like this was his, his thing. Like this was his, the, the, he was the right guy in the right place at the right time. Uh, made this, got this movie made, helped cut it. You know, it, like it feels like, I don't know, feels like he he's the reason why we're still talking about this movie. Fun fact, also just throwing this out there because it was a cute little quirk I noticed in the credits. The movie is sound designed by Nicholas Becker, and I was just like, this has got to be a small world. Uh, Nicholas Becker is now the Academy Award winning sound designer for Sound of Metal. Oh, oh, you talked to him. Yeah, I did. I interviewed him. Love for, Sound of Metal. I interviewed him for Sound of Metal, and we talked about all the different microphones he used to create the illusion of going deaf. And it's actually a very, it was a very fascinating conversation. There is a yeah, a Cinefix feature on it. I'll bet you there's been a link to that feature in the description this whole time we've been talking. Whoa, Whoa. who knew? <laughs> now there is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is just like that scene in Bill and Ted's where he's like, remember to put the trash can in there. But this was one of his early movies, and it's kind of cool to think it's kind of it was kind of cool to see him pop up here. I I mean the sound design is is pretty good. I mean it's not there's not nothing in the sound design department. There's a in fact there's one scene where it's a scene right after they get kicked off the roof, right? The cops show up mm -hmm. to the roof barbecue and they start get, and then like their buddies kick them out of the roof and they're like kicking mad going. What what I love about that scene is that it's it cuts straight to the clock and then it cuts to them on the playground. And the fact that they have to, they get kicked out of the the tough guy party on the roof, and then they're sitting pouting on a playground is so wonderfully perfect. And then there's also a weird little, there's a weird little jump cut in the middle of that scene too. They're just sitting there sulking, and then there's like a like a swooshy kind of dip to color dissolve thing that jump that time jumps a little bit in the middle of that too. It's it's a strange choice, but it's but your guy Nicholas Becker did some good work on it. He did great. So like I said, I was debating between Hubert and Kasovitz. Uh I think I'm going to go with my heart over my head. If I was being like logical and objectively looking at this, I would choose Kasovitz. I'm going to Hubert really vibed with me. Like he kind go. of made the whole movie for me. So I'm going to I'm going to make a personal choice is... and, and say Hubert is my MVP. 
what the hell are we even doing this show for? Why why even have a podcast if you can't go with your go with your heart over your head? That's what the, the that's what the point is, you know? That's the whole point. <laughs> All right, Cal, uh if you can, we got time for one more segment. Great. We always have time for one more segment. And this segment And especially out- this movie, we for sure have time yeah. for this segment for this movie. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So let's uh, let's let's add a little levity here, not to the film itself, but to the podcast, and mm-hmm. let's ponder the question that everybody always ponders when they watch any movie ever in the history of time, which is how would this film have been better or slightly tweaked with the inclusion of one of America's greatest cultural exports, uh, Nicolas Cage. There's a lot of choices. So 1995, 1995 would have been like leaving Las Vegas, kiss of death, uh, Nick Cage. He was squarely in the Nick Cage. No, he I, was I taking down statues at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who, who are you going to put him in, Alex? Asterix. Easy. Okay. Easy. Yeah? yeah. I was watching the movie and I was like, that, that was, that was, that's Nick Cage. And I, I feel like sometimes we talk about the meta aspect of it too. It's like, how would you react mm-hmm. when Nicolas Cage randomly pops up? If Nicolas Cage randomly popped up in this moment, I would be shocked and delighted. So I would love it. Yeah. And yeah. if you were just in there speaking bad French. Like, yeah. That, Dancing that around shirtless. Incredible. No, that this is. Yeah. It, it's it was the, like when I was watching the movie, I was like, oh, th- easy. Done. Nick Cage. That's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Honestly, that's better. You know what? I my pick was the Notre Dame cop. Yep. Uh, mine too. But I'm I'm Nick's I'm Nick's in that because that's asterisk it's, is uh, I think that's correct. Yeah. Point here is, is that like, you know what? We're all we're all feeling bad lieutenant poor to call Nicolas Cage being channeled in here one way or another. And if it's <laughs> like, if it's like asking, cause I do agree that Asterix is definitely on the, uh, you don't have a lucky crack pipe vibe, you know? Yeah. You remember that, you remember that scene in, in, uh, leaving Las Vegas where he falls through the glass table next to the pool. Yes. And he gets up and he's like, I'm a prickly pear. <laughs> like that energy <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. in the asterisk scene would, would be great. Yeah. The easiest, easiest part of the podcast for me was that. No, nope. I, yeah, yeah you, totally you were right. You won this one. Quick, quick, quick tangent though. Do you guys watch, and not just when you're prepping for this show, but mm-hmm. when you watch a movie now, do you like earmark the spots where you think Nicolas Cage should be? Oh yeah. No, this podcast like, is ruined Any movie me. that you watch yeah. and like, oh yeah, no, that's where Nicolas Cage is. Oh goes. yeah. Yeah, that's, that's why I pitched it as a segment. I have been doing this for years. <laughs> you are actually <laughs> Nicolas Cage's years. agent. I've been doing this for years. Yeah. <laughs> I just like making movies so much. Um, <laughs> that was good. <laughs> uh, hey, thanks. Okay. Well, I think we all, you got us all on the same page, Alex. Good work. Where's this movie rank for you guys? Well, you guys had never seen it before yes. yesterday. And I, having only watched this movie a handful of years ago as part of a movie list, uh, I didn't have it on my list either. So Man. this is clearly just a Dan joint. And I'm, let's see, I'm Where, being told. Um, where's this on. on Dan's list? Nope. 16 16 it is so dan classic this for at number 16 this is dan's independence day oh my god and it made me at least independence day didn't make me this sad <laughs> right i'm just sitting here thinking about That's, the movie I mean, getting had, sad had boomer not made it out of that tunnel then maybe you'd be this true sad oh i would have been really sad not, there's no it's still that's that's the small potatoes. Honestly, if Boomer didn't make it out of that tunnel, they probably would have beat those aliens' asses faster because like that's the motivation you need. <laughs> I mean, ask now. Ja, right. ask Keanu. Uh, so Dan had it at number sixteen. We all had it unranked. So this is a Dan special. Where's this winding up? How does Dan juice his own algorithm to uh, get this yeah. up there? It's somehow going to be number four. Only one person having it at sixteen is like, well, that makes it number six. So what do you guys guess that it is? Well, okay, so I, trying to Prince, remember where Independence Day was. Well, it was, also, it was seventies or eighties, right? And it, I, Princess Mononoke was an Alex joint, and I think that was like twelve on my list, and it was like seventy eight or something. Yep. So where does this one land? So I'm gonna say late eighties. I'm gonna say like eighty nine or something. Yeah, eighty nine. Eighty nine. I'll 89. take the under. You'll take the under. Clint, I'll take the under. You win. It is. Oh, I that was a good guess on my part. It was though. a great guess. Okay, it, Lion is number eighty seven. I don't. I don't hate a movie this. that. Which is ironic, I, considering I don't that it is yeah, I don't called either. hate. You know, it makes it makes sense based on, like how this. Uh, you know, what are we twenty eight episodes in now? Um, how the list is shaping up that makes that makes sense to me. Do we want to strike it? I actually don't think we need to. I'm fine with not striking. You don't want to? 
I, even though I've been bummed out this whole past two hours, I these I'm three fine. amigos do not deserve to be struck. Yeah. Well, neither <laughs> did the others. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wow, this is another three three dudes though. No, I'm I'm fine keeping it on. I'm fine I, keeping mostly because I I I feel like in thinking about the list, like holistically, this is I want some of this energy on our list. Yeah. Oh yeah. We, we got to keep this. Hundred percent yeah. agree. I'm fine with this. Thanks, Dan, for making a legitimate um, contribution, unlike other things you've done. Dan, finally, that's don't. It, yeah. I, I'm sorry. That sounded an awful lot like you were thanking Dan for something, uh, which I no, know you're right. was I, unintentional. It was. It was. It's the beer. It's just. It's, it's, it's been beer a long. It's and, the beer. And, like, it's you're still sort of thinking in French from watching. Lion it's a, it's like, been a long. I, I it's, it. a, it's been a long day. Somewhere, Dan is like like the camera. He's watching this, and the camera's behind him, and he's got his you cat know, and his weird he's, doctor claw he, thing happening. He's just he's, like, ah. he's definitely he has a hairless cat. You know it. And he's oh, just, you know he's got he, a hairless he, cat. You know he's you know he's got it's a hairless the cat. ugliest thing in the room, no matter where he yeah. is. He's just yeah. like I need to get more black and white foreign films on this list in order to give them credibility. Yeah, I mean he's not wrong. <laughs>